Psychology of Criminal Conduct, Chapter 10, Prediction and Classification of Criminal Behavior, Part 2. Fourth Generation Assessment, the Integration of Case Management with Risk Needs. Having well-researched evidence-based assessments and treatment intervention does not mean that they will not be or that they will be used in the real world. The translation of knowledge to practice is problem in the criminal justice system, just as it is in the other fields. <clears throat> the example, medicine. For example, even though risk, the risk principle is widely known across the United States, a survey of 97 correctional programs in Ohio found only 20% adhered to the principle Third generation risk needs instruments are intended to assist staff in allocating supervision resources appropriately, risk principle, and targeting intervention need principle in a study of probation in the Canadian province of Manitoba, Bonta and his colleagues. Bonta, Rouge, Scott, Bourjan and Yassine. 2008, reviewed the case management practices of 64 probation officers. Case files were read and probation officers submitted audio recordings of their sessions with probationers. There were a couple of important findings relevant to the present discussion. First, and just as Lowenkamp ETL 2006 found in their U.S. study, probation officers showed poor adherence to the risk principle. Example, medium risk offenders were being seen as frequently as low risk offenders. Second, the analysis of, re of the recordings indicated that probation officers were not focusing on the criminogenic needs identified by the risk needs assessment. But the failure to act on the criminogenic needs has been replicated by Dutch Bosker and Whitman, 2016 Canadian. The Manitoba probation study confirmed the fear that the although empirically based assessments were being administered, they were not being used. A more structured mechanism was clearly needed to ensure that probation officers do not lose sight of the assessment when dealing with probationers. Fourth generation instruments emphasize the link between assessment and case management. This means more than adhering to the risk principle and targeting criminogenic needs. It also acknowledges the role of personal strengths in building, in building a pro-social orientation. The assessment of special responsivity factors to maximize the benefits from treatment and the structured monitoring of the case from the beginning of supervision to the end. Fourth generation instruments include COMPASS, the service planning instrument, and the most widely used fourth generation instrument, the level of service case management inventory. Because the well of the wealth of research and the instrument's well-developed theoretical base, the LSCMI, is used to illustrate the features of the fourth generation assessment. The 10 original LSIR subcomponents were re reorganized to better reflect the central eight risk need factors. Section one of the LS CMI provides the overall offender risk score. As the section is based on the items of the LSIR, meta-analytic -anal reviews have found scores on the LS CMI to predict both general and violent recidivism. In addition to the core risk needs assessment of section one of the LS CMI measure specific risk needs and need factors, and responsivity issues. Section two recognizes the need to assess as aspects of the person and this person's situations that may have criminogenic potential for the particular individual. For example, a sexual offender would be asking questions about the relationship to the victim, and a person involved in the family violence would be queried about intimidating and stalking behavior. Table 10.4 presents an overview of these sections. The LSN 
RNR also shares the same subcomponents with the LSCMI except for sections 9 and 10. In section 5, attention is given to the responsivity considerations that may influence how staff will relate to their clients and supervise their cases. Thus, need, thus the LSCMI covers the three major principles of effective intervention, risk, need, and responsivity. The assessment of responsivity factors is, is certainly not exhaustive in the LSCMI, nor is it highly detailed. It covers only some of the major responsivity factors and correctional staff are encouraged to explore other responsivity variables. Finally, the most important feature of the LSCMI is the integration of the assessment with case management. Referring back to section nine, of table 10.4, setting concrete targets for change and choose a means to reach these goals. Furthermore, each contact with the client, section 10, requires a record of progress or lack of progress in reaching the goals. All of this information is in one booklet. Ensuring that staff remain focused on attending to a client's risk and needs in a structured manner. In summary, fourth generation assessment includes a comprehensive sampling of risk and needs, responsivity considerations, and the integration of, the, of this information with case management. The assessment of needs includes both criminogenic and non-criminogenic needs, as both types of needs influence the supervision plan. Figure 10.3 summarizes the four generations of risk assessment. Resource note 10.1 gives a case example of the LSCMI assessment. I'm going to go ahead and go back so that you may read. Here is the chart 10 point, or it's figure 10.2. And then here is 10.4, a brief sampling of the level of service case management inventory. Here's 10.4, section five, special responsivity considerations. 10.3, resource note 10.1. There's quite a few of these, so. The General Applicability of Theory-Based Offender Assessment. The GPCSL perspective holds that variations in behavior are explained by the fundamental principles of cognitive social learning theory. The behavior of individuals is under the control of rewards and costs within the personal, interpersonal, and inter immediate situations of action. Note the word behavior in the per per previous sentences without qualifying adjective. Criminal, this is purposeful. <coughs> Excuse me. The general principles of learning, modeling, operant, and classical conditioning, self-regulation are applicable to all behaviors. Also, the central eight are the main risk need factors in GPCSL. For a psychology of criminal conduct, this means that assessment and treatment strategies that are derived from a GPCSL perspective would have wide applicability to different populations. The example, woman, minority, mentally disordered, and different types of criminal behavior. Example, violence, sexual. The level of service instruments, LSIR, LSCMI, etc., were developed from such a perspective. In this section, we turn to the applicability of level of service, LS, instruments across samples and criminal outcomes. LS risk assessment across 
different populations. Within the criminal justice system, there are youth and adults. There are female, males and females and LGBTQs. There are the poor and the rich, and there are some who suffer from mental illness. We can classify all of them in many ways, and when we do so, we will find variations in their criminal behavior. For example, men are more like, likely to engage in crime than women. However, does this mean that the risk factors differ substantially by group? To answer this question, we turn to the evidence of the predictive validity of the LS instruments with respect to age, gender, and race ethnicity. Age, the youth level of service, case management inventory, YLS, CMI. It consists of 42 items organized around the central eight risk need factors. There are also six parts to the instrument, which includes a general risk need score based on the 42 items and a case management plan. Like the adult LS CMI, the youth LS instrument is based upon theory and its relevance to youth. Administration of the YLS CMI is normally with youths between the ages of 12 and 17, although it has been used with youths as young as 10 years old. Schwab, 2007, examined the predictive validity of the YLS CMI for general recidivism. 11 tests for the instrument yielded a mean of AUC of 0 0.64. This AUC was in the same range as other youth risk needs assessment skills that were included in the review. Example, PCLR youth version. Schwab is also undertook a calculation to estimate how many negative findings would be neg needed to overturn the positive predictive validity of the YLS CMI. It would take 48 negative findings. In another meta-analysis, Mark Oliver and his colleagues uh, identified 44 studies of three risk instruments used, within youth, used with youths. 22 studies were of the YLS, CMI, or slightly modified versions of it. 27 were youth versions of the PCLR, and there were nine studies of the Savory Structured Assessment of Violent Risk in Youth. All three instruments predicted general and violent recidivism with no one scale outperforming the other. For the youth YLS, CMI, the average AUC was 0.68, K equals 19 for general recidivism and 0 0.65. K equals 26 for violent recidivism. The most recent review compared six youth assessment instruments and their relationship to future violence. The two most commonly used tools, the YLS, CMI, and SAVERY, both demonstrated equivalent predictive validities for the YLS, CMI, and the AUCS's ranged from 0 0.57 to 0 0.76 with higher AUCSs for male use. An important feature of the LS instruments is the preponderance of dynamic items facilitating the monitoring of cases, case progress and evaluating case treat, evaluating treatment interventions. There have been a number of studies of the dynamic validity of the YLS YLS CMI evidence for dynamic validity has been positive when reassessments occurred more than six months after initiating testing, but not for shorter periods. As mentioned in the introductory par paragraphs of this section, justice-involved persons can be classified in many different ways, but the GPCSL informed assessment should be relevant no matter how groups are informed are formed the yls cmi has been applied to widely diverse cultures subgroups within cultures and such unique samples as persons with fetal alcohol disorder gender the ls instruments are also expected to apply similarly to men and women this statement has not been without controversy as some feminist scholars have pointed out, that the LS instruments were largely developed on male samples, thereby applying a male normative view of women. Moreover, the LSIR in particular has been criticized 
for giving insufficient attention to gender-based variables. Example, emotional distress, low self-esteem. Gender-based variables are not part of the central eight and so consequently were not represented in the LSIR. There will always be studies that report findings that are unsupportive of the LS instrument with women offenders. Example, Rizik, Hotfreder, and Marash, 2006. For this reason, findings from meta-analysis are important because they present a truer picture of what is the norm and what are the outliers. Paula Smith, Francis Cullen, and Edward Latisa, 2009, conducted a meta-analysis of the LSIR and recidivism for female offenders. In total, the studies reviewed involved 14,737 women. The average mean AUC was 0 0.70, K equals 27. Examining the LSCMI and the prediction of recidivism, Andrews and his colleagues actually found that the instrument predicted better for women the mean AUCSs was 0 0.75 for men and 0 0.83 for women. In Kate Garrity and Jessica Widdoms' 2015 review of nine risk scales, the LS perform, also performed better for women than, other, uh, than the other assessment instruments. There's a lot. In the largest meta-analysis of the LS instruments, the mean AUC was 0 0.67 for men N equals 77,920 and 0 0.68 for women N equals 17,802. The YLS CMI also does not make any special judgments for gender. In a meta-analysis by Schwab, the AUC was 0 0.68 for young males K equals 4, and 0 0.72 for girls, K equals 3. Note, however, the few studies that were available for analysis, a review of Bipush and Holtfrieder, 2018, replicates the general findings reported by Schwab, but with a much larger sample. For male youth, the AUC was 0 0.66, K equals 39. And, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and for the young women, it was 0 0.64, K equals 30, with overlapping confidence intervals with respect to violence recidivism. There were no significant differences between males, AUC equals 0 0.67, K equals 20, and females, AUC 0 0.64, K equals 8. Additional subgroup analysis setting geographical location outcome measure found no differences in the performance of the YLCMI as a function of gender. Researchers have been examining whether gender responsiveness, GR factors, could add predictive power beyond scores on the LSIR at the forefront of this research are Patricia Van Voorhees and her colleagues from the University of Cincinnati. They have developed supplements to be used for women in addition to the LSIR. The supplements consist of two sets of paper and pencil measures thought to be particularly important for women. The measures included, for example, anger, hostility, adult victimization, parental stress, and self-esteem. Validation studies were conducted <coughs> in the states of Colorado, Hawaii, Minnesota, and Missouri with three types of samples, inmates, probationers, and pre-lease offenders. At the time, Colorado, Hawaii, and Minnesota used the LSIR, and therefore the predicted validity of the LSIR may be compared with the validities of the GR supp supplements. There are two important findings reported by Van for his, <coughs> excuse me, ETL 2010. First, a number of the supplemental measures predicted outcomes, serious misconducts for inmates, and recidivism for women in the community. However, there was not one measure that consistently predicted across samples. For example, relationship dysfunction and child abuse predicted prison misconduct for inmates, but did not predict recidivism for the Colorado pre-lease sample, and yet predicted recidivism for the Minnesota probation sample. Second, the GR supplements improved prediction in most but not all analysis.
Thus, more research is needed to identify which GR variables consistently add to the predictive value of the LSIR or to the extent to which any other assessment instrument is truly gender neutral. Future research should also ensure that GR factors are truly gender specific by testing these factors on male samples. The example of abuse history could also affect men. Immensely influential in our understanding of women in crime has been the Pathways to Crime model has suggested that women follow five pathways to crime that are different from those followed by men. Daly hypothesized the following five pathways. One, street women leaving conditions of abuse and surviving on the streets though through pr prostitution, theft, and drugs. Two, battered women suffering extreme victimization and acting out aggressively toward others. Three, drug connected using selling drugs often with those with close inmates for harmed or harming and harming physical and sexual victimization with chronic criminality five other economic crime theft embezzlement the pathway approach is consistent with the gpcsl's view of multiple routes to crime for example abuse in the home may lead to running away and in order to cope with life on the street the young runaway may turn to prostitution, theft, and drug use. Note that majority, the majority of indicators of gendered pathways are well-known risk, factor, risk need factors. However, the pathways model suggests that some criminogenic needs may be more important for women than for men. There is some evidence that this may indeed be the case. For example, Van Voorhees, ATL 2010 found that the LSIR subcomponent of alcohol drugs was particularly predictive in, of recidivism, as did Andrews ETL 2012 a meta analysis by Terry Scott and Shelley Brown 2018 found that the central eight risk need factors were equally predictive of recidivism for male and female youth. However, two commonly proposed gendered risk factors mental health and child abuse failed to predict recidivism among female youth. In addition, contrary, contrary to early, earlier reports, substance use, misuse did not predict recidivism, although chronic alcohol use among girls was predictive. The debate over the appropriate risk need assessments of women will no doubt continue. There are many fine nuances arising from the research that will need to be incorporated into practice. Evaluating the appropriateness of gender neutral risk need and the, the added value of GR assessments is important to work and this work is ongoing. The strong reaction to gender neutral assessments by feminist scholars seen 15 years ago has softened. Many are now engaged in collaborative efforts to integrate gender neutral with the GR assessment, an approach welcomed by the RNR model. It may, however, be difficult to identify empirical, gender specific risk need factors. In general psychology, the evidence shows that there are more gender similarities than there are differences. In a review of 106 meta analysis on the gender similarities, hypothesis Zell. Krizen and Teeter, 2015, found that when differences were found between genders, they were small, R about 0.10, or I think 0.10. Let me make sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, 0 0.10 or 0 0.10. Ethnicity, race, culture, in general, ethnicity refers to a person who identifies with a certain group that is characterized biological and culture, a shared language, religion, etc. Given that many risk needs instruments have been developed in, on Caucasian males from Western countries, it is very important to study the extent to which predictive validities apply to ethnic, racial, cultural groups. As with gender, the research would inform practice and theory. The number of, this, of studies on the LS instrument with respect to race and ethnicity 
pales compared to the women's literature given the Canadian origins of the LS instruments and the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples. In the Canadian offender population, there has been much interest in the applicability of the instrument with these people. The LS research is also of interest in other countries with significant indigenous populations, such as the United States and Australia. A meta-analysis by Holly Wilson and Leticia Gutierrez evaluated the predictive validity of the LS instruments with indigenous peoples 12 studies that yielded 16 independent samples of more than 21,000 indigenous persons were identified. The mean AUC was also was 0 0.67 for the prediction of general recidivism. Wilson and Gutierrez also examined the predictive validities for the LS subscales. When compared to non Indigenous offenders, five subscales predicted more poorly for the Indigenous peoples, criminal history, education, employment, companions, alcohol, drugs, and pro-criminal attitude. This finding is reminiscent of the results from the LS research with women where some of the subcomponents had greater weight in the prediction of recidivism. Research with other ethnic, racial, cultural groups has produced more mixed results. Some studies support the U.S. the use of the LS with African American and Hispanics. Others find that the LS to predict the, for Hispanics but not African Americans, and still others reported better prediction for African Americans but not Hispanics. For use, the results are also mixed. <laughs> From these individual studies, it appears that when an LS instrument does not predict for minorities, the effect sizes are smaller compared to Caucasians. However, Oliver ETL's 2014 meta-analysis of the LS research suggests otherwise. For Caucasians, the mean AUC for general recidivism was 0 0.67 for minorities. The effect size was 0 0.65, a breakdown of minority groups. Indigenous, Black, Hispanic, Asian also found no significant differences in predictive validities. This pattern of results was also found for violent recidivism, as often repeated in this book. Meta-analytic -anal findings trump the, the results from individual studies. Summary. The review of LS instruments with respect to age, gender, and ethnicity, race, culture speaks to the validity and generality of the central eight down, derived from the GPCSL, the LS instruments, and other assessment tools developed on a largely male Caucasian samples have been particularly criticized for introducing bias into the risk needs assessment of justice-involved minorities and women. Researchers have responded to their criticism by attempting to cross-validate the instruments with minorities and women. Where differences are found, efforts are made to calibrate the instrument to fit the group under study. For example, Indigenous offenders score higher on risk than non-Indigenous than non -indigenous offenders. In response, Wilson and Guterres, 2014, calibrated, adjusted the risk groupings of the LS for Indigenous clients to meet a higher degree of fairness. Although calibration is one way of reducing bias, it may not be completely satisfactory. <coughs> Primary studies continue to contribute to our understanding of the practical utility of the GPCSL perspective and the extent to which the LS instruments apply to ethnicity and race and culture. What all of this means is that the risk factors identified with the GPCSL may be applicable but to a wide range of justice-involved persons. This finding does not deflate the importance of gender, race, and ethnicity. It just reveals the extent to which offending reflects the central eight risk factors across samples. LS risk, factor, LS risk and violence outcomes. In the beginning of this chapter, predictive accuracy and the two by two table, we show the difficulties in trying to, to predict low base rate behaviors compared to nonviolent offending for which base rates often fall in the 40 to 60% range. Violent offending is much lower, 10 to 20% range, and certain forms of violence are lower still 
Example, sexual offending is in the neighborhood of 5%, despite the difficulties in predicting low base rape behaviors. The seriousness of the harm caused to victims demands special attention to the prediction of violent behavior. The general approach for dealing with the assessment of risk needs for violent behavior is to develop specialized risk scales. Underlying this approach is the idea that those who commit violent acts are different from different enough from the run of the mill involved run of the mill justice involved persons that we need a unique set of predictors. Two risk instruments that are considered by many to be especially good at predicting violence are the PCLR discussed in chapter eight and the violence risk appraisal guide. A chapter poses the question, is an LS general risk need assessment instrument based on the GPCSL useful in the prediction of violent behavior? One way to answer the question is to compare some of the instruments spe specifically designed to predict violent recidivism with the LS instruments. There are three meta-analytic -ana summaries that found the LSIR to predict violent recidivism as well as the PCLR and the VRAG ETL 2002, Yang ETL 2010. Table 10.5 summarizes the, these meta-analyses. None of the violence specific risk scales, PCLR and VRAG, predicted better than the generated LSIR. The confidence inf intervals overlapping among the scales. In general, research with the LS suggests that a general theory-based risk needs assessment can predict violent behavior as well as the violent risk scales. One advantage that the LS has over the violence risk scales is that the LS measures the dynamic risk for factors that are so important for the management of high-risk violent justice-involved persons. Most of the violence risk scales are composed of static items and have ignored dynamic risk factors. Can the prediction of violence be improved? Research of on violence-specific risk scales continues and progress is, made, is being made. In the LSCMI, the introduction of an APP subcomponent and specific items that deal with violence is likely to bring improvements in predictive accuracy. For example, Lena Gerard and Stephen Warmworth found that a history of the of aggression together with the APP is as measured by the LSCMI yielded an AUC of o, of 0 0.75. So here is the closest of the 10.5 LSIR violent recidivism. Obstacles to using empirically based risk needs assessment. GPCSL strongly endorses risk need assessment for treatment purposes, as will be shown in the next chapter. Treatment can reduce recidivism in order to link assessment with treatment. At a minimum, third generation instruments that measure criminogenic needs are required. However, there are there remains indications. Oh, I'm sorry, indications that many pr practitioners and correctional systems are not enjoying the full benefits of the research findings. There are many possible reasons for this state of affairs and to deserve comment. Reluctant to, reluctance to abandon clinical judgment. Given that we are in an era of fourth generation assessments, why then do some professionals still weigh their clinical judgment at least to the same degree? if not more, as act actuarial assessment methods. For example, in Varese and Groves' survey of 491 clinical psychologists, almost all, 98%, used clinical judgment and 31% used actuarial methods. Others have also found forensic practitioners using assessments to assess risk that are mostly inappropriate. The answer is complex and involves a number of factors, Resource Note, note 10.2 provides a listing of some of the possible classification destru destruction techniques. So here is Resource Note 10.2. 
Excuse me. There is a cold going around, and here is the closeness of the remainder of that chart. And here, number two, adherence to second generation risk assessment. Considering the fact that there are a number of well-validated third and fourth generation risk assessment instruments, it is puzzling that there are many jurisdictions that use mostly second generation static risk assessment. Internationally, there are practitioners who still rely on professional judgment. There are a number of explanations for this state of affairs. First, there is the argument that the pre that predictive efficiency trumps a comprehensive assessment. As noted earlier, some researchers have gone in the opposite direction and taken third and fourth generation instruments and distilled from the items that predicted the best with the result of a much shorter risk scale. Yes, the abbreviated risk scale may be may display the same effect size as the score on the whole instrument, but these short scales consist of mainly static items and miss the assessment of criminogenic needs. Second, the, and related to the first, may be an underlying belief that justice-involved persons either cannot be rehabilitated or do not deserve to be rehabilitated. In the next chapter, we will see that the evidence clearly shows that the rehabilitation works. Unfortunately, if one believes if in only punishment for lawbreakers, then there is not much that can be done in terms of rehabilitation. And finally, the use of brief static risk scales may be due to financial constraints. After all, third and fourth generation instruments require more training, monitoring for integrity, and in some cases, paying commercial fees. Mixing professional judgment with actuarial structured professional judgment. Structural clinical judgment, SCJ, guides the professionals to consider certain factors that are scored, but does not combine these scores to a total score linked to a risk need category. This overall risk needs classification dis decision is left to the professional. An example of the HCR20, the HCR20 is, the 20, is a 20 item instrument consisting of 10 historical items. Example, previous violence, five clinical items. Example, lack of insight and five risk management items. Example, plans lack feasibility. Although each item is scored zero, one, or two, and the scores are added up for a total score, there is no instruction as to what score corresponds to low, moderate, or high risk. The professional makes the final judgment in an international survey of 434 forensic experts. Neil and Grisso, 2014, found the HCR20 tied, tied with the PCLR in its use of assessments of risk for violence, 35.6% of the experts reported using these instruments. Although SCJ appears to be an improvement over unstructured clinical judgment on meta-analysis on sexual offender assessment found its predictive accuracy to fall between first and second generation assessments. Two meta-analysis have focused on the HCR 20 with general and justice involved persons, Campbell French and Gendro, in the prediction of the violent recidivism, while Yang Yuang and Quaid found a large AUC of 0 0.75, K equals 16, N equals 4,161. A recent meta analysis of the HCRR with women found an average AUC of 0 0.64, K equals 5, for general recidivism and 0 0.68 K equals 6 for violent recidivism. Systematic non-meta-analytic -meta reviews of the HCR20 have reported average AUCSs of 0 0.69 and 0 0.75. The HCR20 predicts as well as many of the actuarial instruments. So how do we reconcile these findings to the fact that there is a level of clinical judgment, first-generation assessment involved with the HCR20. 
The answer may have much to do with the care taken in administering the HCR 20 Kevin Douglas and Catherine Schaefer 2021 described the multiple steps in completing the HCR 20 that involve interviews, psychological testing, and gathering information from multiple sources by those with a high level of expertise, such a level of professional commitment to the assessment process may be a huge factor in the predictive validity of the HCR 20 and other similar instruments. Professional override. Related to the preceding discussion is the use of a professional override to the actual risk score. A professional override is altering the risk level calculated by the instrument. Instrument example, uh, the risk scale may score an individual as low risk, but the assessor overrides the risk to medium risk because of the violent nature of the crime. Sometimes policy may dictate an override. Example, all murders are classified as high risk for the first year of imprisonment before being reclassified to a lower level. Professionals often and should exercise discretion in making decisions. It is an important part of a fair and just system. In fact, the LS instruments have a section where overrides may be considered. Professional override was also principal in the original and expanded R&R model. The use of overrides must be used sparingly and must be justified within the LS CMI. The recommendation is that overrides should not exceed 5%. However, overrides may have sometimes exceeded this guideline ranging from approximately 4 to 15%. In the case of the LSCMI, Frechette and Lucier, 2021, excuse me, almost 11% in the case of the risk needs assessment used in the U.S. federal system and as high as 32.5% in a study of the YLSCMI, CMI, High rates of sexual offenders have also been reported, approximately 35%. Whether the override increases or decreases measured risk needs level, and it usually increases risk needs, predictive accuracy almost always decreases. The excessive use of an override is not good cor correctional practices practice and tends to increase prediction error. Does this mean that overrides should be abolished? Paul Meal, 1954, has provided an example demonstrating that a professional override can be valuable. His example is of a client who has attended a movie theater every Saturday night for the past 10 years. It seems a safe bet to predict that next Saturday the client will go to the, out to the movies. However, what would you predict if you were told to, that the client broke a leg Friday evening. Overrides should be used as an opportunity to improve our assessment by systematically monitoring the use of overrides. If patterns emerge, then they may be used to incorporate or perhaps discover a new principle of assessment. Some of these, this work is taking place, but much more needs to be done. The future of offender assessment there has been considerable progress in the assessment of justice-involved persons and changes continue to at a rapid pace. The professional judgment first-generation approach to assessment is now hard to defend, but it is still used in some quarters. Evidence-based second-generation assessments are widely accepted, but many of them focus on static risk factors and thus limit their usefulness for risk management. The importance of the objective assessment of criminogenic needs reflected in third generation assessment is demanded by GPCSL. Third generation assessments will eventually be replaced by fourth generation assessments. Evaluations of third and fourth generation assessments will be conducted with the first samples and various outcomes which will lead to new applications and improvements. This is already happening with the youth and adult versions of the LSCMI and the LSRNR. Algorithms and machine administered risk need assessments. Second to fourth generation assessments are actual, actorial 
Ectorial, I think that's how you say it, in nature and have led to, in recent years, to machine-based algorithmic assessments. That is, a computer gathers relevant information that is optimally combined with, to formulate an assessment of risk. On the face of it, it, this appears to be a good way of minimizing bias by removing the human assess, assessor from the formulation of risk. Even if bias is found, it is relatively simple matter to program a new algorithm to minimize bias. Computerized risk assessments have also found their way into courts in the form of, pre of pre pretrial assessments. Compass is a fourth generation assessment. The assessor gathers information from the client and collaterals inputs the information into a web-based program and the software calculates risk needs and a case management plan. There are other instruments that have web-based administration, but what has attracted attention to Compass is that the formula for calculating risk needs is not transparent due to software propriety. Recall from the beginning of this chapter that clarity and transparency should be features of all assessments. This has made Compass vulnerable to criticisms of bias, especially racial bias. Critics of risk needs assessment also argue that items such as employment and education levels are proxies for minority status and therefore fundamentally unfair to certain segments of society. In 2016, Julia Angwin and her colleagues analyzed Compass data from a country in Florida and found that Compass overpredicted recidivism for blacks using the same data Dressel and Farade extended the findings by presenting 449 lay people with short narratives of the defendants that provided only age, sex, and criminal history. The participants were, act were asked to judge their chances of reoffending within two years by classifying the defendants as low, medium, or high risk. The AUC for the non-experts was 0 0.71 and for Compass, it was 0 0.70. In a second study, 400 new participants were given the same presentations, but this time race was included. The AUCSs, when race was included, were almost identical to when race was excluded. The authors concluded that commercial software that is widely used to predict recidivism is no more accurate or fair than the predictions of people with little to no criminal ju justice expertise. The reports by Engwan Etl, 2016, and Dressel of and Fadrid, or I'm sorry, Farid, 2018, received significant media attention. Their findings fly in the face of the general meta-analytic studies showing that actorial outperforms professional judgment. As expected, the two aforementioned studies were vigorously challenged by researchers from North Point, the publisher of Compass but also from researchers who have no commercial interest in Compass. Essentially, the problems with the analysis used to criticize Compass were that, one, the vignettes presented were overly simplistic and unrepresented, unrepresentative of the real world, and the lay, two, lay persons were given immediate feedback on accuracy and thereby improved their predictions over time. When more complex data without feedback was presented in this form, in the form of the LSIR and PCRA, an instrument used in the U.S. federal probation, the actorial assessments outperformed lay judgment, ensuring that risk need instruments are bias free and will continue to be a goal of researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. Almost all of the risk need instruments of today have deleted items such as race, gender, and age. This was not true 30 years ago. Guidelines and recommendations for minimizing bias in the criminal justice system are presently available. Example, Vincent and Vilohin and should be followed. Assessment of strengths. Strengths are factors that decrease the influence 
influence of risk need factors or protect against risk. For example, a supportive prosocial family may mitigate the influence of pro-criminal peers. There are some debate as to whether strengths are simply the absence of risk factors or an independent construct from risk. Terry Scott and Shelley Brown, 2018, conducted a meta-analysis of 22 studies comparing risk with strength factors for justice-involved youth. Examples of the Strength domains were pro-social peers, education, employment opportunities, and pro-social attitudes. Note that strengths in this study were the inverse of dynamic risk, pro-criminal peers, unemployment, and pro-criminal attitudes. Scott and Brown found non-involvement non in substance misuse and having pro-social peers predicted an absence of recidivism for both male and females. However, for some of the other strengths, example, education, employment, the prediction of success varied by gender, the r, &R model and the LS instruments have sometimes been criticized for being overly, fo overly risk-focused. However, as we, can, we have seen, the assessment of the strengths is reflected in the r, &R model. Principles 10 and 11a and in the LSCMI, LSRNR and YLSCMI Although the three instruments require the assessor to judge if a subcomponent may be a particular strength for the individual strengths do not form a score. There are other assessments instruments that do not quantify strengths and it appears that strengths do add to the prediction of recidivism. Natalia Jones and her colleagues Jones, Brown, Robinson, and Frey, 2015, found high strength scores as measured by the service planning instrument, SPIN, mitigated recidivism among high-risk clients. Similar results were found among indigenous and non-indigenous adults under community supervision. However, in a large study involving over 50,000 youths and adults, the risk need high by strengths interaction was not found. In addition to the predictive validity of strengths was measured by SPIN, dynamic validity has been demonstrated for predicting technical violations and new charges. Future research with the SPIN and other similar risk needs instruments will certainly clarify the strength, nature of strengths and its usefulness in assessment. Assessment of acute risk needs. An exciting development is the assessment of the acute dynamic risk factors. Acute dynamic risk factors are risk needs that can change in a very short period of time. Example, intoxication, loss of job, collapse of social support system, being able to reliably identify acute factors has enormous Practical utility, imagine a probation parole officer or a correctional officer being alerted to a crisis and intervening before an imminent criminal event. The assessment of acute risk factors goes beyond the more slowly changing Central 8. The dynamic risk assessment of the of offender reentry stands out as an example of an assessment that tries to capture acute risk factors. Some of the items include sudden changes in negative mood and newly presented opportunity to access a victim. Davies, Lloyd, and Polishek examined the DRAOR subscale scores in, on, on 966 high-risk parolees from New Zealand. Because the sample was high-risk par parolees, they were assessed on a weekly basis. There were over 16,000 assessments. They found reassessments of acute risk factors to be a robust predictor of recidivism. Trauma-informed risk need assessment. Excuse me. Adverse childhood experiences, ACE, can have lasting effects on physical and psychological well-being. Recall Chapter 7. ACE is also a predictor of adult criminality. However, ACE is not a criminogenic need. It may predict future criminal behavior, as does criminal history. But once an individual has experienced ACE, it cannot be reversed. 
Criminogenic needs are dynamic and can be reversed. Example, one can develop a drug dependency and one can overcome the addiction. This does not mean the ACE can, is to be ignored in the assessment and delivery of treatment. Rather, ACE can be considered as a specific responsivity factor. It is the personal emotional consequences of ACE that are obstacles to successful treatment. Before you can provide trauma-informed correctional treatment, the assessor must one, determine if the person had experienced ACE, and two, evaluate the range and severity of the consequences of ACE. Establishing the occurrence of ACE can be as simple as asking a few questions. It can range from a brief inquiry as part of a general risk needs assessments to a detailed and comprehensive assessment. For example, in the LSCMI, there are a few questions asking about a history of physical and sexual abuse in childhood. The assessment can be can also be comprehensive by using questionnaires that cover a, in detail the three general categories of ACE, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Upon identifying childhood traumatic events, practitioners need to be need to assess the post-traumatic effects of ACE. As examples, the levels of anxiety and interpersonal distrust may need to be evaluated and the extent to which substance misuse is used as a coping mechanism for unpleasant memories. These personal reactions to ACE and many others will greatly affect the development of a case management plan and how treatment is delivered. More will be said about trauma-informed care in the following treatment chapter. The responsivity of principle is all about the, the how of treatment and requires trauma-informed assessment. Work has begun on introducing tra trauma into risk needs assessments in a comprehensive manner and attention to the post-ACE well-being of the individual needs to continue. Risk needs communication. This chapter began by highlighting the, the prediction of criminal behavior is central to the activities of criminal justice and crime prevention agencies. The decisions made by based on risk needs of the individual affect, of, affect the provision of services and the lives of those who come in conflict with the law. With so many players involved, the communication of risk needs in a useful manner is important to, deli to delivering the appropriate degree of supervision and treatment. Everyone must work from the same page. Recently, there has been increased attention as to how the results from a risk needs assessment are best communicated. For example, does one provide a specific score from a test along with the probability of reoffending or just a risk needs level? Example, moderate risk needs. Further complications arise when different instruments are used. Does a low risk rating on the LSCMI equate to a low risk on SPIN? Some assessment tools have three risk needs levels. Example, LSIR, and some have five assessment tools have three risk needs levels. And some have five levels, LSCMI, even the label of high risk can have different meanings to different people. The problem of making sense out of the results from multiple risk needs instruments was addressed in a wider paper sponsored by Council of State Governments and the U.S. Bureau of Justice Assistance. <sighs> Excuse me. Hansen ETL 2017 proposed a common language of risk needs that is defined in part by the individual's criminogenic needs and predicted recidivism rates. The panel settled on five risk needs levels. For example, in level two, the person has only one or two criminogenic needs and a predicted recidivism rate of five to 29% over two years. Note that labels such as moderate high risk are not given only numerical values with each level there is also recommendations for the amount of treatment required and the need for custody. There have been a number of tests of the five level system with different risk needs instruments. A study by Daryl Croner and Bree Derrick compared the classification rates from the LSIR and two newly created risk instruments using the five level system. One of the new risk scales was created 
by selecting the best six predictors of recidivism from the correctional agency's database and the other scale was a selection of seven high, most highly correlated items with the LSIR. All three instruments predicted recidivism equally well, AUCSs in the low 0.70s range. They found a four to five percent improvement in correct classification with the five level system. This may not appear to be much of an improvement, but when a correctional agency supervises cases in the thousands and hundreds of thousands, the improvements are substantial in program efficiencies. Further tests of the five level systems have been conducted with the, the DRAOR in New Zealand and with risk assessments for sexual offenders. In general, improvements in prediction and consistency have been noted. Although the five level risk communication holds promise three, there are challenges researchers need to extend the findings to other groups, example, intimate partner violence and outcomes, example, general violence. Thus far, the five level system has been adopted by only a few jurisdictions worldwide. Integrating neuroscience into risk needs assessments. There is a considerable literature attesting to the importance of neurobiological factors for understanding criminal behavior, Chapter 4. There have been calls for introducing neurobiological factors into risk needs assessments, but many challenges are faced. Although neurophysical, uh, neuropsychological tests are used in forensic assessments, they are used mostly in insanity defense hearings or to assess emotional injury rather than criminal risk. Incorporating neuropsychological testing into a, the far more frequent activity of assessing risk and needs in the justice system at this point in time would be extremely costly. Highly trained professionals would be needed to administer and interpret specialized tests. Perhaps computerized assessments may be developed that would be cost effective and at the time we may have fifth generation assessment protocols. We leave this chapter with a reminder of some general guidelines for the use of offender assessment instruments. See resource 10.3. Here is the assessment for 10.3, and I will kind of, there, it's nice and focused. So you can pause that and read that. Worth remembering, criminal behavior is predictable. Predictions of criminal behavior exceed chance levels. However, these predictions are not perfect, and to expect perfection is unrealistic. Other fields, example medicine, do not ha pr have perfect prediction, but their predictive accuracies are sufficient to have practical value. The same can be said for the criminal justice field. Two, prediction is enhanced through knowledge of theory. The theory and research in PCC may be translated into valid objective and practical assessment instruments. The highlighting of the central eight and dynamic risk factors are desirable features to have in assessment. The principles of risk, need, and responsivity can be reflected in assessment. The principles of effective intervention suggest who may profit from treatment services, the risk principle, who should be targeted, the need principle, and how treatment is delivered, the responsivity principle. Fourth, fourth generation assessments are integrated with case management plans. First generation assessments are unstructured clinical judgments of risk and they need they perform poorly in the prediction of criminal behavior. Second generation assessments predict well but mostly comprise static risk factors. Third generation risk needs instruments identify the criminogenic needs of offenders while fourth generation assessments example LSCMI guide the actual delivery of services targeting criminogenic needs. Five, assessment based on GPCSL has wide applicability. The evidence suggests that the, cor the correlates of criminality are mu much the same across differing populations, example gender. The evidence also suggests that many of the factors that predict general offending also predict violent offending. Recommended readings, and here you go. 
And this is the end of chapter 10, part two. Thank you.